Sandhu. And uh, he's going to, he's a postdoc there uh, with David Woodruff. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, like tight bounds for adversely robust streams. So he's been doing a lot of interesting work on uh, like various kinds of streaming algorithms. So I guess it will be a fun talk to look forward to. So go ahead, Sanjay. Yeah, thanks for introduction. Um, so like Didi said, this is uh, uh, tight bounds for adversarially robust streams in sliding windows via difference estimators. And this is joint work with David Woodruff. Uh, so this is a long title. There are a lot of things here. Uh, so let's break down like each of the terms one by one and we'll go from there. Okay, so um, the first concept we'll talk about. Sorry, one second. Uh, can I, okay. Yeah, so um, uh, let's first introduce a streaming model. And this is a very vanilla model that uh, you know people have probably seen in the undergrad classes, but let's just uh, be consistent. So in this model, we'll have an input elements of an underlying data set S arrive sequentially. And um, the goal is to evaluate or approximate some given function using space that's sublinear in the size M of the input. So I haven't really stressed uh, what exactly each update model is, but uh, we'll leave that um, down the road. So let's suppose that we have a sequence of bits and we see them one at a time. So we see one, then zero, then one, and so forth. And maybe at the end, you know, the goal is to compute the number of bits that are one. So here, the answer is just uh, five for the first eight bits. And it's uh, pretty... Okay, so what problems do people care about in the stream model? Well, three of the most basic problems uh, we'll study today. One of them is the heavy hitters problem. And we're given a set of M elements from a universe of size N. So let's just think of each update in the stream being an integer from one to N. And the goal is to um, find the heavy elements. So what does that mean? Let's suppose that um, F sub I is the frequency of each element I appears in the stream. And we'll let the L2 norm be the quantity defined here, which is the square root of the sum of the squared frequencies. So the goal is to find a set of elements so that uh, given a threshold uh, epsilon, we output all the elements that appear at least epsilon times L2 and no elements that appear less than you know, some fraction, let's say epsilon over 16 L2. So we're allowed some error in that we're allowed to output some elements that are not quite epsilon heavy, but we you know, epsilon over 16 heavy. The uh, second definition prevents some trivial um, solutions where you just output like the whole universe. Um, people also consider the case where you want to output an approximate frequency for each, um, for each item, but uh, we'll save that for now. So the motivation for study having hitters is uh, iceberg queries, where we have a database of queries and um, we have a large number of uh, queries that are repeated over and over again. So we don't want to spend resources answering these queries each time. So it's good to identify these queries and save on that by kind of uh, explicitly answering them. Another motivation is DDoS prevention, where we have some network and we have some user maybe maliciously sending out a lot of packets on this network. So if we identify them, then we can prevent them from spamming the network. Now, to actually resolve this question, notice that we have to def define the um, L2 norm here. So that leads to our next question that's often studied in the streaming model. So this is the question of frequency moments. So given a set S of elements, we again have the same definition for the frequency of each element. And uh, if we have a parameter P, then the frequency moment is the sum of the P powers of each of the frequencies. And we can actually finagle this a bit um, so that a one plus epsilon approximation to the frequency moment is like maybe one plus epsilon over two or one plus epsilon over three. So some like constant multiple of one plus epsilon um, approximation to the LP norm. So these two problems are often related like estimating the norm of a frequency vector or estimating the uh, frequency vector, the frequency moment. So the goal again is just to output a one plus epsilon approximation to FP. And this is often studied in entropy estimation or linear regression for P equals two, for example. The last problem we'll talk about is the problem of distinct elements. 
And here we can think of this as just the previous example with p equals zero. But more formally, it's the number of elements that appear in the stream, unique, uh, unique elements. So again, we want to output the one plus epsilon approximation to f0. Okay, so what's been done on these problems in the streaming model? Well, uh, for f0, there's an algorithm with space one plus epsilon squared plus log n. For p with p between zero and two, there's a one over epsilon squared times log n algorithm. And there's a separation for p less than two and p greater than two. So once p becomes bigger than two, we can't do polylogarithmic anymore. And so we have space uh, one over epsilon squared n to the one minus two over p times some log factors. And it's known that this n to the one over two over p factor is necessary. We also have a space algorithm, uh, one over epsilon squared log n for L2 heavy hitters. So this is the state of the art for some of these important streaming algorithm uh, problems. Okay, so we can finally get to one of the terms in the title which is an adversarially robust stream. So here, we again have elements of an underlying data set, but they arrive sequentially and adversarially. Our goal is still to evaluate or approximate a given function using space sublinear in the size of the input. We have a slightly different model for how these elements appear. Namely, suppose we have a malicious user, an honest user, and uh, suppose we're trying to track the number of bits in the stream again. So the model will be as follows. The malicious user will give us a bit of the stream, say one. And the honest user will tell us how many bits have appeared in the stream. One. Then the malicious user uses the output from the previous round to generate a new input, let's say zero. And the honest party will have to generate an approximation to the number of bits. This game continues round by round until eventually the malicious user compels the honest user to make a mistake and then the malicious user has won. So as an honest user, we are trying to produce a uh, accurate approximation to the function at all times in the stream. The idea for adversarially robust algorithms is that future queries may depend on previous queries. Namely, if we look at our database application previously, um, we might query the database, get an answer, and then whatever answer we get might affect the query that we make in the next round. So that these uh, inputs aren't really independent. Another motivation for this is the recent work in adversarial uh, ML. So we've probably all heard of these uh, one pixel attacks where uh, you know, there's some classifier, um, it outputs a picture of a dog, Sorry, there's an input that's a picture of dog and it classifies this picture as a dog successfully. And then we modify one bit, sorry, one pixel in this picture and suddenly the classifier thinks it's a cat. Uh, so I'm definitely not going to be as bold as saying that uh, we actually handle problems in adversarial, adversarial ML, but that does give us some motivation for studying these models. Okay, so what's been done for uh, adversarial robust streams? This is actually a pretty recent model. So um, some of the work is just either in the last year or the last two years. So Ben Eliezer et al. showed at pods last year that there are algorithms that use polylog space for F0, uh, which is distinct elements, FP estimation for P between zero and two and heavy hitters. So they did show that, you know, it is possible to get efficient algorithms for these problems. They also show you know, a sublinear space algorithm for FP. So the takeaway from their paper is that they give a general framework that loses nothing in N and only one over epsilon factor. And uh, you know, I have this asterisk next to loses because uh, you know, we lose like log log N factors or log one over epsilon factors. Um, anyway, lower, lower fact, uh, order factors for now. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so, um, so I was right if I could ask a question. So, um, so is this, um, do you, if I understand correctly, it's only a problem for if your sketch is randomized. If you have a deterministic sketch like Misha Gries, then you just, I mean, it's trivial. You get all these yeah. results. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, so, are, um, so are you aware of, or so are you gonna talk about 
the work, I think by, so Kevin Yi um, and maybe, so Graham Cormo was involved in this, where they were tracking kind of the value of something over the entire course of the stream. This is from about five or 10 years ago. Um, I will be talking about strong tracking. I don't know if I'll be talking about their work specifically, um, um, but. Uh, um, so I think it's called like functional monitoring or something like that. Oh, um, I don't think so, but I'd be glad to talk more about it. Uh, uh, sure, okay, this. then yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I can tell you more later. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great, that'd be great. Um, yeah, this is definitely a new area. So uh, there's only been like, you know, the tip of the iceberg has been maybe maybe explored, but there, there I'm sure there are a lot of open questions here. So um, that also reminds me, like um, I don't actually see the chat box. So uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to just interrupt me. Um, I, I won't yeah, be able to, uh, yeah. I can, uh, yeah, I can uh, read out questions if, yeah. So especially students, if you guys want to paste something in the chat, I can read them out to Samson. Okay, yeah, great. Um, you know, not only is this kind of a new model, but uh, there are lots of open questions. So I think, you know, if, if you have any uh, suggestions or um, observations, you know, please point them out. Is uh, one question, is this epsilon corresponding to the strength of the adversary? Or what is this? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the epsilon is the accuracy parameter uh, for these problems. So um, we're not going to find um, FP exactly or find the number of elements in the stream exactly. We're going okay. to find a one plus epsilon approximation, approximation factor. Yes. Yeah. So uh, all these algorithms do not depend on the strength of the adversary. Whatever may be the strength, uh, the all these bounds will remain the same. Or we fix the strength of an adversary. Yeah. Um, so we do not assume anything on the adversary. They can take exponential time. Um, and that's still fine. Um, we actually do get sharper results for some of the problems if we bound the adversary, you know, if the adversary has to answer in polynomial time. But, um, but these results right here uh -huh. uh, do not assume anything about the adversary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, along those lines, so I think um, Arnab was just pointing out the, what is epsilon here. So again, you know, this is a framework that loses nothing n and only one over, over epsilon. But uh, you know, what what is epsilon exactly? Well, uh, you know, for the unsigned integer range, we have n equals two to the thirty-two, which is around four billion. Um, for comparison, you know, maybe three hundred billion emails are sent per day, and if we want accuracy zero point zero one, then one over epsilon is a hundred, and that's our that's that's actually larger than log n. So we should care about the um, one over epsilon factors just as much as we care about log n factors. So this implies that um, you know maybe the previous work uh, doesn't lose any n factors. It also doesn't lose any log n factors, but we should care about the one over epsilon factor that it loses. Um, so I think this motivated some of the work by Hestum et al. Uh, NeurIPS last year, um, which gave better algorithms in terms of the epsilon dependency. There's a trade-off for the log here. So notice that um, the previous work gave dependency one over epsilon cubed, and this is one over epsilon to the 2.5. The log factors went up from log one or uh, log n to log n to the fourth. Um, but one um, cool kind of contribution about this paper is that they use differential privacy to hide the randomness of uh, each of these algorithms. So I've actually never seen kind of differential privacy being used in streaming algorithms before. So I thought it was a really cool contribution. Um, and you know, if you kind of hide the randomness of the algorithm, this kind of goes back to maybe the paradigm that Jeff was pointing out that you know if you have deterministic algorithms, there and the adversary can't really do very much. Okay, so our results are that um, we get tight bounds for each of these algorithms, so we don't lose any log factors and we don't lose any one over epsilon factors. So we essentially say that no losses are necessary. And again, this is ignoring poly log log n and poly log one over epsilon factors. Okay, so this is kind of the summary of these problems. Um, but this is only one of the models. The second model that was in the title is the sliding window model. So we still have a data stream. Elements arrive sequentially, and we want to approximate some function in terms of that. Now the input only consists of the m most recent updates in the stream. So the stream can be much longer than m, but we only care about the m most recent updates. 
So let's suppose we have a window of size eight and we see these bits one at a time again. So we see a one and a zero and so forth. And let's suppose we see eight bits. Now the data set is the entire eight bits. But now we see a ninth bit and that implicitly expires the first bit. So our data stream is now, sorry, our underlying data set is just now the eight most recent bits and so forth. But the challenge here is that when we get a new bit, the expiration is implicit. So we don't actually know which bit has expired. Um, this may be okay for uh, bits, but you know you can think of more complicated problems where if you get rows of a matrix, maybe one row has expired entirely and you don't know any entries in that row that's expired. This seems like it could be problematic. In particular, if you're familiar with the idea of linear sketches, it's really difficult to maintain linear sketches for sliding windows because you can't undo the effects of the rows that expired. Anyway, the sliding window model really emphasizes recent interactions. And so it's appropriate for uh, time sensitive settings where we only care about you know, the uh, most recent uh, data that's relevant. Okay, so what's known for the sliding window model? Um, well, for, F, for, uh, um, for distinct elements and high frequency moments, um, along with uh, L2 heavy hitters, it's actually known that there's pretty much no loss in um, epsilon. Sorry, no loss in n. There are some losses in epsilon, but, uh, but not by much. For p between 0 and 2, there are quite some losses for epsilon, namely for uh, F2. We have 1 over epsilon to the fourth compared to 1 over epsilon squared in the streaming model. So this is a quadratic loss. Um, but again, you know, this loses nothing in N. So we get a result that uh, shows we don't actually lose any factors in epsilon. And surprisingly, this is actually the same framework as before. So we use a concept called difference estimators, which I'll describe way later in the talk. But this framework solves both, uh, well, gets the algorithms for both this uh, sliding window model and the robust model. Okay, so that's the background. Um, as I said, you know, there's some framework that we'll talk about. Uh, so we'll, we'll spend like uh, most of the next uh, 20 or so minutes describing this uh, framework. Uh, but this also might be a good time to pause and take any questions. So just to clarify, so far you haven't spoken anything, said anything about difference estimators, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and I'll actually not talk about difference estimators too much in the next part either. Um, I'll mention why it's useful, but uh, first I'll talk about the frameworks for each of the previous problems. Okay, okay. yeah, I was just making sure that I didn't miss a definition or something. <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. right. right. <laughs> Okay, so let's first talk about the, one of the most well-known algorithms for how you approximate F2 in the streaming model. So um, this is due to Alain, Matthias, and Chegri, and it's uh, again, you know, like one of the most famous algorithms in streaming algorithms. Um, the idea is that we want to approximate the two norm of F in a stream, and before we do that, we just generate a sign vector of length n. So we have, you know, n vectors or n entries. And each of them are negative one or one with, uh, po with probability half. And now all we do is we track Z, which is the inner product of the sine vector S with the frequency vector F. So this is this term S1, F1 plus all the way to Sn, Fn. And this is something we can track in the stream because whenever we get an update to the ith coordinate, we can just uh, look at Si explicitly and update our, uh, our running total for Z. So if we want to consider z squared, we can look at the expected value of z squared, and it's the sum over ij of si, sj, fi, fj, which is kind of a mouthful, but you can think of it as like any you know, combination of two indices. So by linear of expectation, we can look at the sum of the expectations. And now what is the uh, expected value of each of these terms? Well, if i equals j, then si equals sj, uh, so it's just going to be si squared, which is one. So for anything that's uh, i equals j, we're going to get a contribution of fi squared. 
But if i is not equal to j, then um, they're independent. So the expected value of si sj is just zero because they're going to have opposite signs with probability half and the same sign with probability half. So any of the cross terms kind of contribute expected value zero. And that shows that the expectation is just uh, the sum of the squared coordinates, which is just F2. Um, one can do a similar calculation for the variance and show that it's at most two times F2 squared, which means we can use the typical like Chebyshev um, inequality to show that uh, you know, one of these estimators is kind of close to the uh, desired product. So if we take one of our epsilon squared of these, take the mean of them, then the variance will drop, the expectation will stay the same, and so we'll get the one plus epsilon approximation by this uh, should be should inequality. It's kind of um, a paradigm that uh, you know you want to reduce the variance if the expectation is, is good. Okay, so I'm sure like uh, all or, or most of you know this. Um, now, why am I um, bothering to describe AMS? Well, the point is that the AMS works for F2 in the string model, but not in adversarially robust string model. And here's an attack on AMS. So we can learn S, whether SI equals SJ from looking at the inner product S with uh, EI plus EJ. So all we have to do is make our stream just induce EI EJ by uh, inserting an update into coordinate I and update into coordinate J. Now, um, fi will be 1 if si equals 1, and uh, f1 will be negative 1 if, SI equals, uh, if, f, if si is not equal to 1. So we can learn these signs. And uh, then if we define this vector, then uh, the inner product will just be m. So this vector will have once everywhere. But the point is that these, sorry, we'll have one or negative one everywhere. But the point is that uh, whether an entry is one or negative one corresponds exactly to the sign in the sign vector. So there's no randomness anymore. Every term in this inner product will contribute one. There are m um, updates in the stream. So the inner product is m. And this is deterministic. So z squared is going to be m squared, which is definitely not the f2 of the stream. Um, this is one inner product, but we can kind of do this multiple times, maybe, and uh, we might fail. Uh, I'll describe a more formal argument or a more general argument on the next slide. But what happened was that the randomness of the algorithm, namely the, the assignment of the values of the signs, is not independent of the input anymore. Remember, previously, we generate the sign vector in advance, and then we look at the expected value compared to the frequency vector but this expectation doesn't work out anymore because they're not independent. Okay, so more generally, suppose we have a linear sketch, which is um, a class of algorithms that includes AMS. So linear sketches are not robust to adversarial attacks and they must use omega in space, linear space. And this is due to Hart and Woodruff. So the attack at a high level is that if we have a linear sketch, we have a sketch matrix U and we want to query something in the kernel of u. So we'll have an iterative process, and we'll start with a vector, a subspace v1. So the goal is that we'll find vectors that are weakly correlated with u, and they're orthogonal to the running subspace that we have so far. We use these vectors to find a strongly correlated vector v, and we'll set vi to be the span of um, all the vectors that we've seen so far. So the point is that we learn the sketch matrix and we carry something in the kernel of the uh, in the sketch matrix. So we're going to output zero, but whatever we query is not going to be zero. So we're definitely going to mess up on this algorithm. So again, the moral of the story is that any linear sketch must use omega n space. Okay. Uh, but we have these algorithms that don't use linear space. So again, you know, kind of what happened. And the point is that deletions are needed to perform this attack. So we want to find vectors that are correlated with rows of these sketch matrix. 
But the most efficient way to do this is to find a vector, reset our frequency vector back to zero, and then find another vector that's correlated with the sketch matrix. So basically, we're just querying all these different directions and looking at the inner product with the sketch matrix. Um, this is possible if it is a stream that allows deletions. But if we're not allowed deletions, then when we make these queries in different directions, the vectors have to get longer and longer. And at some point, we're going to run out of room in the stream. So the key is that if we assume insertion only updates, this attack is no longer valid. And there's some, there, there are these similar separations known for the sliding window model in the sense that if deletions are allowed in the stream, there are strong lower bounds for the sliding window model. OK, so let me describe the idea for most of the sliding window algorithms. This is called the smooth histogram framework, and it's due to Braverman and Ostrovsky. So suppose we're trying to approximate some function. And uh, we have a streaming algorithm for this function. Then each time a new element arrives in the stream, there are three instances that, um, that uh, report close values, and we're going to delete the middle one. And then we use different checkpoints to kind of sandwich the sliding window. So that probably doesn't make sense at all. So let's uh, use a, you know, like a picture to, to illustrate this. OK. So let's say that we have a stream of length 8, sorry, a window of length 8. And we'll start a new instance each time a new element arrives. So we have uh, a, a goal of looking at the number of ones in the sliding window. And we see a bit, which is 1. So we start an instance of the algorithm. Then we get another update. We see another bit. We start another instance of the algorithm. We get another bit. We start another instance of the algorithm. So basically, all we're doing right now is starting a new instance of the algorithm each time we see a bit. Now, what's going to happen is that uh, if we keep doing this, we're going to have to use too many instances. So we have to do some kind of cleaning step to get rid of redundant instances. And the idea is that each time there are three instances that report close values, we delete the middle one. In particular, in the example that we have here, the red and green algorithm report close values. So there's no point for this uh, pink algorithm. It's always going to report the same thing as the green algorithm. So we, we should get rid of the pink algorithm. OK, then let's keep going. And we'll see something else in the stream and so forth. And again, you know, we have a couple of algorithms that are pretty close to each other. Namely, if we want a two approximation, then this uh, red and blue algorithm will sandwich the green algorithm and make it redundant. So anything that's captured by the, the green algorithm should have already been captured by one of the other two. So there's no reason to have the green algorithm either. And we're going to keep doing this as the stream continues. At the end, we'll have some kind of data set. So that's some kind of structure that uh, has different algorithms starting at different points in time. Now, if we're doing this right, the number of instances that we have is log n. So we kind of lose a log n factor in the space. But the point is, now we have the last eight bits. We don't have an algorithm that starts exactly at the beginning of the sighting window. But we have one that starts right before and one that starts right after. And they're within a factor of two. So we can also get a factor of two approximation for the number of bits in the window. So this is called the smooth histogram framework. The main idea is that we want to start instances at each point in time, but also do some cleaning step at each point. OK. So, uh, so just to be clear, so you'll have uh, like the instances that you keep are only ones where where your count uh, changes by a factor of two, is it? So that's the reason you just have log n uh, things. Yes, that's right. So if we, yeah, you're right. So if we want a one plus epsilon approximation, we might need one of our epsilon log n. Um, right, right, right. And uh, uh, you're not, you're assuming there's no deletions in this. Yeah, yeah that's crucial. Uh, if yeah, there are deletions, true. then. Then you um, said nothing can be done. Yes, yes, that's okay. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so this is the smooth histogram framework. It works for a lot of uh, sighting window algorithms. Um, but this, the point is that uh, you know each time we have a one plus epsilon change, then we kind of need to do something special. Okay.
So the next thing we'll talk about is a robust algorithm framework. And it's actually pretty similar. So suppose we're trying to out approximate some given function and we have a streaming algorithm for this function. Again, like it did you point out, it's crucial to assume that the stream is insertion only. And we can assume that this function is uh, monotonic. Actually, it's necessary that this function is monotonic. So the work by Ben Eliezer et al. gives something called the sketch switching framework. And the idea is to start many instances of the algorithm at the beginning. So the sliding window kind of starts one instance at each point in time. This starts everything at the beginning. We'll use an instance of the algorithm, but we'll freeze its output. And each time the next instance has increased by a factor of one plus epsilon, then we use next instance and freeze that output. Okay, again, this is a mouthful, so we'll look at uh, illustration again. So we use the same example where we want to get a two approximation to the number of ones in the stream. This time, we start all the instances at the beginning. We have four algorithms that track the number of ones. The first algorithm is going to be frozen, so it will always output one. And we are always going to use the output of the first algorithm until um, the next algorithm has a property that's increased by one plus epsilon approximation. Okay, so let's ignore what I just said if that didn't make sense. Let's just look at the next bit. Um, it's a zero, so everything is still outputting one, so we still look at the first algorithm. Now we get another bit. And the first algorithm is frozen. So the red instance will always output one. But all the other instances output two, which is now a two factor away from one, which means that if we keep outputting the red instance, we're not going to be accurate. So we're going to switch to the yellow instance, and we're going to freeze that instead. So for the next few bits, we're going to use the output of the yellow algorithm, except we're going to freeze it. So we're always going to output two. We get another bit. We're still frozen on the yellow instance, so we output two. The red uh, instance is always frozen, so we're not even going to look at that. Another bit, and so forth. Now, the purple instance is a factor two away from the yellow instance, so we're going to freeze that sketch, and we're going to uh, switch to that. OK, so at the end of the stream, there are going to be um, seven bits. And we don't switch to the last instance because they're not a factor two away. But notice that the purple instance is outputting four, which is still a two approximation. So the key here, again, is that every time the algorithm has increased by a factor of one plus epsilon, then we want to do something special. So I had a very quick question. Uh, yeah. So it, I mean, so somehow is the idea that the adversary is able to see what you're doing, but they're not able to see these like hidden algorithms? Yes, exactly. So at each point, we're only outputting the frozen out, uh, output. So we see the adversary sees four, they see four, they see four, and so forth. So they can't see what you're doing in the future ones. But once the function has increased by one plus epsilon, you need to do something special or else you're not going to be accurate enough. So you're going to you're going to switch to the next algorithm. But the point is you freeze that algorithm and the adversary will only see that output. So they'll still see a one plus epsilon approximation, but uh, you're not revealing any randomness about the future instances that you haven't exposed. And the past instances whose randomness you have exposed, you're not going to use again. Right, right. That's a very cool trick. Yeah, I can imagine it's very general. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this, you know, uh, is a framework that gives a lot of algorithms for uh, these robust models. Um, yeah, so is this, um, so, um, so are you saying this is an old framework or is this? Um, so yes, this, yes, yeah. this is, um, well, it's old in the sense that it's previous work. It's not old in the sense that it was only done last year, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. It's nothing uh, that we're contributing. Um, so, um, so there's a similar idea in so these, um, so these robust leaderboard algorithms. 
where they were, so like in a Kaggle competition, where people would keep posting kind of algorithms and and you could kind of figure out what the oh, what the test set was by asking by posing lots of algorithms at it. And so I think I think Moritz Hart was was involved in this where they kind of only revealed the the change to how well you're doing if you improve by so much. Um, this is about three or five years ago, um, and it, it 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 showed you could provably prevent leaking of what the test set up to, uh, you know, up to some approximation. Oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. It sounds uh, actually very similar in spirit to, to this. Uh, you know, again, it's also like you only change the output if you improve by a certain amount. So, right. so yeah, it sounds very similar. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess like maybe, maybe the issue or like maybe, you know, um, this wasn't discovered earlier because there wasn't as much excitement about the robust algorithms due to these adversarial attacks. Yeah, so I'm, probably lots of these ideas are just floating around in the folklore or buried within lemmas and so forth. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but both uh, this robust algorithm framework, like they call it the uh, sketch switching and the smooth histogram framework are, I think, very natural ideas where, you know, you do something special when the output has improved by a certain amount. Um, so yeah, like the summary is that, uh, you know, you use roughly one over epsilon squared space each time the output increases by a certain amount. Um, but the function kind of increases by one over epsilon, um, increases by this amount by one over epsilon times. So the space you'll get is like one over epsilon cubed. Um, and the idea for a smooth histogram is similar um, but it could actually be worse because of the smoothness parameter. But uh, basically, each of these need to switch one over epsilon, you know, probably one over epsilon times, and you're already spending one over epsilon squared space each time, so you're going to get an overhead that's more than one over epsilon squared. Okay, so now we're going to be jumping from um, previous work to some of our ideas. And the first observation is, do we really need to pay one over epsilon squared space each time the output increases by one plus epsilon? So let's look at these streams in the bottom left corner. But suppose that uh, the red instance handles a stream that induces a frequency vector u. So this entire red block um, corresponds to a vector u. And this yellow block corresponds to a vector u plus v, so that the v is kind of the tail of the yellow vector that doesn't appear in the uh, red vector. And we want to compare the pth moment of u versus the pth moment of u plus v. And we're assuming that uh, the pth moment of u plus v has only increased by 1 plus epsilon. So this is the tail. And namely, what we have is that uh, the difference at the end is just going to be epsilon times the pth moment of u. Um, there's nothing special going on here. We're just assuming that the pth moment of u plus v is 1 plus epsilon times the pth moment of u. So if you, if you subtract you know, the pth moment of u from both sides, then the, the difference is only going to have epsilon times uh, the pth moment remaining. But yeah, so the point is that the difference is really small. And we're essentially paying 1 plus 1 over epsilon squared space to estimate this difference. But we really only need a constant factor approximation to this difference. Like it's you know epsilon times fp of u. So if we if we're off by a constant factor approximation, you know, we only mess up by like roughly 1 plus 2 epsilon or something. So since we only need a constant factor approximation to epsilon times fp of u, then we only need a constant factor approximation to the That's the moral of the story. Okay. So this kind of introduces a new paradigm, which we call sketch stitching. So suppose we want to look at the moment of u plus v, then we can rewrite this as a telescoping sum of the difference plus the prefix. So we have um, oops. 
we have uh, the moment of the vector. And the first term in the parentheses here is the difference, which is represented by the tail. And the, the, the second term is the prefix. So, I mean, again, there's nothing special going on here. You know, you just cancel the second terms, the, the second and third terms, and you have equality. Okay. More generally, let's suppose that we have V and we can decompose it into V1 plus uh, maybe their B vectors, so VB. Um, for simplicity, uh, B is only two in this illustration, so we have V1 plus V2. So again, we want to estimate the difference. But we can rewrite this uh, more, uh, we can expand this out and get a more complicated uh, telescoping sum. So we have the sum of the first B terms minus the sum of the first B minus one terms plus the sum of the B minus one terms minus B minus two terms and so forth. Um, again, there's nothing really special going on here. The positive term in each parentheses cancels out with a negative term in the previous uh, parentheses. Namely, you know, this, this term right here cancels out with uh, this term right here, if you can see my mouse. And everything that's left after you cancel out everything is just, um, the, it is this uh, first term and this last term, which is minus FP of U. Um, so we'll have uh, F, so, so this uh, first term right here is FP of U plus V. And sorry, there's a missing term here. There should be another FP plus U so that this term cancels out with uh, this term. But the point is that we can decompose this um, frequency moment into a bunch of differences. So this kind of motivates our difference estimator, but I haven't really talked more about how we're going to do each of, how we're going to define each of these vectors. But hopefully this uh, sketch stitching paradigm makes sense. We're just stitching together a lot of differences to get a estimate of the sum. Um, so are the way you're decomposing this just like the like dyadic intervals on the, on the stream or is there something more clever? Um, so I'll talk about the next slide, but uh, a spoiler is that it's, it wants to be dyadic, but uh, it's more dyadic on the values rather than length of the stream. Uh, so it's not dyadic on the, the, on the length of the stream, but it's dyadic in terms of like how much FP increases by. Uh, cool, okay. Uh, so it's probably like the, the, the natural thing that you would think, but uh, you know, let me just talk about this on the next slide to make sure we're on the same page. So we're just gonna set the, each difference to be exponentially decreasing. Um, like I said earlier, I haven't actually defined how I'm going to define these vectors V1 and V2. You know, there's some split between them, but I haven't defined how that's going to be determined. Um, so we have each of these differences now. And the way we define each of these differences is that um, the B difference is going to be roughly one over two to the B times FP, uh, the, the uh, pth moment of U. So this doesn't change the correctness. The correctness is still, I mean, this telescoping sum, it's just now we've added some meaning to how these vectors are defined. So we're going to have this picture instead of the other picture. The previous picture had, um, let's just go back, we had V, had a purple and blue kind of even because V1 and V2 take up equal lengths of the stream. But now due to this um, exponentially decreasing value, we have V1 be much bigger than V2. So again, nothing special has happened here. All we've done is define how these V1s and V2s are determined. But now the point is that the B vector induces a difference that's 1 over 2 to the B times the youth moment of V. That is this third bullet in the slide. And we only need a two to the b times epsilon approximation to this difference to get an epsilon approximation overall. So the hope is that because we need such coarser uh, approximation, then we can use much less space. So the hope is to use space, you know, one over epsilon squared, but then lowered by a factor of uh, two to the two over two b.
So just to take a step back, this is our framework. We're going to have a number of algorithms running simultaneously for each granularity. We want space um, much less than one over epsilon squared for the bth granularity. But we actually do need two to the b instances for each granularity. And this will be a proof by picture. So um, let's suppose that we have uh, granularity epsilon at the beginning. That will correspond to this uh, blue block right here. So we have some randomness that will give us um, an estimate of uh, the contribution of v1. Now, later in the stream, we have a v1. It's much bigger. And then we have a v2 that's roughly the same in terms of granularity as this old v1. So one question is, why can't we just use the same algorithm that we used to estimate v1, use that to estimate v2? And the answer is that once we've used an algorithm to estimate v1, we've output it and let the adversary see the randomness. So we can't really say that uh, the input is independent of the randomness of the algorithm anymore. So each time we output something, we have to discard it completely and not use any of the randoms anymore. So this implies that uh, you know if there are, oops, if there are um, two to the b times for granularity one over two to the b, then we need two to the b different algorithms for this estimation. But this is still OK, because our space is just so much smaller. So you know, if we take this sum, then we get 1 over epsilon squared. And this still doesn't quite work, because we don't actually get the space. But uh, hopefully, the idea is clear. And now I'll finally move on to our difference estimators. OK? So hopefully, that, uh, that framework made sense. And now I'll formally define the difference estimators. But I'll also stop for some questions. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was just saying, yeah, I think it was, uh, we had questions in between. So I think it was very clear. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah so now I'm going to define this different estimator formally. And this will be the most technical part of the talk. But um, uh, I'll definitely be hiding some details under the rug. So recall that um, if the difference is roughly 2 to the b times epsilon, what we want is an algorithm that approximates the difference with space kind of inversely to the accuracy. So the point is that um, the smaller the difference is, the coarser our approximation can be. So hopefully we can use more, uh, we can get away with using less space. So the definition is that given um, a difference that is roughly gamma times the prefix, we want to output an estimate with additive approximation epsilon to the prefix. So we have to parameterize twice, one for the additive approximation we want, and once for how, uh, how much the granularity is. Now, this is actually a problem because um, f in general is nonlinear. So you know a trivial thing you could try is just having a sketch for u plus v and a sketch for u, and take the difference of the output of the two sketches and maybe that is a approximation. Maybe that's an, a, a, a good approximation to the difference. But this is generally not true. Suppose we look at the pth moment of u plus v, and it's 1 over epsilon to the fourth. And suppose that the difference is just 1. Then if you get 1 plus epsilon approximations, um, you know, we can have additive error up to 1 over epsilon cubed. So we definitely will not have a 1 approximation to, uh, to the difference. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is non-trivial. So a bulk of our work is getting these algorithms for difference estimators. Namely, we get a space uh, gamma over epsilon squared algorithm for distinct elements and other parameterizations for the other problems that we care about. OK, so um, let me wrap up by talking about our algorithm for F2 difference estimator. And hopefully, this will give some insight to the other ones. 
So we want an additive epsilon F2 approximation to the difference, which is gamma F2. And we want to use space less than one over epsilon squared. Now, the idea is that we can write, we can expand the F2 of u plus v and u. And this is just uh, this term right here, which is two times the inner product plus um, the, uh, the, the two norm squared of v. And it's known that the inner product property states that a one plus epsilon approximation to u and v gives an additive epsilon times uv approximation to uv. This is just Cauchy-Schwartz. OK? So now recall that the difference is um, this last term on the second equation. And it's equal to gamma times the f2 of u, which implies that gamma times f2 of u is greater than the two norm squared of v. Now, again, we can use Cauchy Schwartz to write the uh, inner product of u and v, bound up by the product of the norms, and relate that to the f2 of u. But now, the difference is that we have this gamma thing right here. So we can look at the inner product property and say that we actually only need a um, epsilon over root gamma approximation. An epsilon over root uh, gamma additive approximation will give an additive epsilon approximation so we can get away with epsilon with a gamma over epsilon squared space. Okay, so that's the F2 difference estimator. Uh, I think it's really nice, it's really elegant. Um, but unfortunately, the rest of the difference estimators do not satisfy that property. Uh, it's much more complicated. I think the analysis is nice, but it's uh, kind of a mouthful to describe. But I'll, I'll try to give some uh, insight to these. So for FP, the general idea is to use p-stable random variables. And p-stable ra random variables are kind of a generalization of what we discussed earlier. So recall for uh, AMS, um, what we're doing is we're generating random signs, you know, plus one, minus one for each of the entries in the vector that we take the dot product with. We don't have to do plus or minus one. We can do Gaussian ra uh, random variables. But in general, um, Gaussian random variables are too stable. And P stable are a generalization of uh, these Gaussian random variables with a different parameterization. Namely, the probability density function of these P stable random variables is that you're going to draw x with probability proportional to the, this, this uh, fraction right here. Now, what's uh, bad about these P stable random variables is that for P less than two, we don't actually have a variance. And we don't have um, an ex there's not even an expectation for p less than uh, p less than one. So um, the question is, how can we use uh, previous work or these p-stable random variables to get difference estimators? So these previous works take the dot product of um, these vectors that are generated by p-stable random variables, and um, they dot the uh, random vector with the frequency vector. And then they look at the median. So this is nice for them, but it's more challenging for us because we need to take a difference of two terms. And it's difficult to estimate or analyze how the median behaves under differences. So this is something that we couldn't do. And instead, we used a uh, a separate algorithm for p-stable random variables. This is called Lee's geometric mean algorithm. And it's actually pretty well, uh, pretty easily stated. Lee's geometric mean algorithm, all you do is you take um, one over epsilon squared of these dot products. But instead of taking the median, you take the geometric mean. And by taking the mean of all these inner products, it's shown that uh, the variance is now defined, the expectation is defined, so you can actually analyze um, the variance of the geometric mean. So uh, to analyze our geometric, to, to analyze our difference estimator, we expand out the um, terms in the geometric mean. We look at the difference, and um, 
again, we need to do some kind of expectation variance calculation on this uh, expansion. That, that's pretty high level, but uh, the idea is pretty much the same. We want these dot products, and we take the geometric mean of these dot products. For p bigger than 2, there are also some challenges, but it looks like I'm running out of time, so I'll skip those for now. Finally, there's some other issues that I haven't really discussed. Uh, we actually want tightness in log n. And the way I've talked so far, we'll not have tightness. We'll lose log n factors from what's called uh, what's a typical uh, Chernoff plus union bound argument. Um, and the typical way to avoid that is using um, a chaining argument. Instead, look at the supremum of a process rather than looking at each, each point in the process individually. Um, and this will give a strong tracking, which I think is what um, may have been what Jeff was alluding to earlier. We look at correctness at all points, uh, correctness at all points in the stream, but, uh, but, but I'm not sure. We, we should probably talk about that afterwards. Uh, yep, yeah, that's it. Great. Okay, cool, cool. Um, there's a, a couple of other things. There is another log n factor floating around there that we have to remove. And finally, everything I discussed so far is just for the adversarially robust model, and we have to adapt it to the setting window model. So there's another challenge there. But in summary, what we do is we provide a new framework for streaming algorithms. There are two steps. One is sketch stitching, and one is granularity changing. And granularity changing, how we define each of the separations in the vectors is using this difference estimator by enabling a coarser approximation and thus less space or smaller granularities. Um, before I move to open questions, I also want to do a um, shameless advertisement that's saying that uh, you know we'll have a sublinear algorithms workshop in late July, uh, in late August. This will be organized by Anesh uh, Bakshi, Ra Rajesh Jayram, and myself. It'll be a virtual format, and we're hoping to get the uh, you know a lot of interaction, a lot of collaboration. So we're we're really trying to target like um, tutorials. One-on-one um, -on -one sessions and open problem sessions. So um, hopefully you'll be able to join. Okay, so I'll conclude with some future directions. Um, I think one thing that's really nice is all this robust algorithm area is really new. Um, so the question is, you know, what other things have we not explored? I'm sure there's a lot out there. We also haven't studied these difference estimators um, as well as we would like. There, I'm sure there are a ton of other applications. There are tighter bounds. And we also don't have general p less uh, greater than 2. We don't have integer p greater than 2. Uh, finally, we don't get tightness for p greater than 2 for our setting window algorithm. So there's an open question there. Um, so sorry, what did you say about p bigger than 2? You don't have what? Oh, for difference estimators or for setting windows? Sliding windows. But yeah, I, I guess the, the comment was the same, the same, but yeah. Yeah, for citing windows, we're only getting bounds between p between 0 and 2. 0 and 2. Oh, OK, OK. So it's still open how to do um, p bigger than 2 uh, and not lose all these epsilon parameters. Is that like a good, like an intuitive reason for such behavior? Um, the behavior for um, um, the smooth histogram parameter is that um, when p is much bigger, you have to track the difference much finer. Like, um, you might only be one plus epsilon approximation off now, but you might get future things in the stream, which force your difference to be much bigger than it actually is right now. So just because you're mm -hmm. off by one plus epsilon now doesn't mean that you can only, you know, you might actually need much bigger granularity than what you think you might need. Oh, I see, I see, I see. OK, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of the intuition for that. Okay, that's great. Jeff. Um, so yeah, um, so great. So very nice talk. So um, so I enjoyed the very so clean explanations of kind of the roots of kind of the main idea of, the, of these of the, of these various techniques. Um, so um, so um, so I'm curious about kind of the the so the relationship between these slightly different so models of strengthening uh, these so streaming frameworks. So you mentioned this strong tracking, which was what I was describing. Like so, I, I think the original terminology that was used like ten years ago was like so functional monitoring. But I, I I think people have called some other stuff. So since then, and the and that's as you mentioned is 
being able to estimate the value at every point in the stream. And it, it seems like this is um, like a stronger sort of requirement than what you're asking for. So you should require some more space. Um, so I'm, I, I, I've, then I kind of two questions in between this. Say, well, I, I don't need to always have the strong tracking. Let's say I have it, um, you know, one minus delta fraction of the time or, right? So I'm allowed some fraction of the time to have, so some errors, right? Mm -hmm. Is, or if you're allowed to make some mistakes, some fraction of the time. So you probably, I mean, th these are all randomized algorithms, right? So you can have some probability of, so failure any, um, so, um, so anyways, I, I mean, is, I, I'm trying to understand how that fits in. Is it like, as, as soon as you have high probability of having one failure, do you lose? Or can you over the course of a long stream allow failure kind of 1% um, of the time? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for streaming algorithms, um, I, I mean, I think that just reduces to a constant probability of success. So um, uh, I don't think um, any novelty and technique is needed there. Um, but for these robust algorithms, um, yeah, so just generally, how is the probability of failure a kind of factor factor into here? Yeah, yeah. So um, the uh, natural way is to say that uh, we require correctness at each point in time. Um, so now we need a probability that's roughly one over poly n, and we pay for that in you know like the log n factor. Um, so we lose the log n there. But um, some of these uh, strong tracking approaches have said actually we don't need to lose this log n because instead of taking you know the union bound, we can just look at the maximum loss we get over the whole stream. And we can show that with a constant probability, you actually lose, um, you know, you, you only have failure with the constant fraction uh, over the whole stream without losing a log n. Um, but this is catered to the techniques. Um, namely, like for this AMS approach, it's a, it's a dot product. So you're taking a dot product and then your frequency vector f is growing and growing and growing. And you're, all you want to say is that um, your dot product is not going to be more than epsilon times the F2 away from the expectation. So you want to analyze you know, the supremum of this deviation. Um, and there are some results known from, uh, I guess, um, Gaussian processes that say like uh, you, you can bound the supremum over the entire um, stream. Um, um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so with high probability, it's, it, it's, never, it's never outside this, the epsilon error through the whole course of the stream, right? That's what this um, tracking is doing. Uh, it, it's not high probability in the sense that it's a constant probability. Right, right. But, so, uh, so but yeah. It's probably one minus delta. It's yeah. never more than epsilon error for the entire uh, course of the stream. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and so what is your algorithm doing, right? It has some probability of failure. Is it? Like at each point, it's the probability of failure is less than. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so we can show that um, the number of algorithms we use is actually like log one over epsilon, like poly log one over epsilon, poly log log n. So we just need our algorithm to have failure probability one minus one over poly log log n log one over epsilon. So that's what we set our delta to be. And that's why we lose like all these log log n factors, but not. Um, we don't lose any factors in um, log n. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay. I see. Um, so cool. Yeah. So um, so I've um, so and so if anyone else wants to ask, I, I think that we've lost most of the audience. But if anyone, I I I have, I have one more question. Yeah, I, I'd be really interested in talk, um, hearing about this functional monitoring application that you, you mentioned. I, I, I think I'm not doing it a service like by saying that it's the same model. Like I'm, I'm sure there are lots of differences. So so. I, I, I would love to understand more about this. Uh... Oh, yeah. So um, so I think the main difference is that they were looking at, I think, what, are, what I typically think as, as, as easier streaming sort of problems, like yeah. the, so like F1 heavy hitters. 
um, okay. for instance, right? So, so they attack stuff like this. There's like a distributed version of it. And it's pretty much what you said, you described it that, that they have, or they'll have, um, they'll, they'll have algorithms that, that they'll guarantee with probability one minus delta, something like that over the entire course of the stream. It, it, it does not get more than epsilon error. Um, so away. And then the, the, in, in some cases, the, um, you know, if you assume total adversarial property, the error does, um, you have to use linear space, right? But if you make other assumptions on, on the data, you can, you can do better, or you can say, here's what the optimal algorithm would be if we knew the whole stream ahead of time, and how closely can we match the optimal algorithm? So, so a lot of these these works I'm thinking about from about ten years ago, where we're we're looking in, in that space of problems. Um, so it's I, I think the, the main results, at least the ones I'm thinking about, are different in two ways. The actual streaming problem, I think, were the simpler like F1 heavy hitters, and and they weren't, and a lot of the results were not like the full adversarial way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, so, but I can, um, so, um, so I'll send you a paper, um, so that they'll give you pointers and, and so you can see, um, okay, okay. so yeah, so I, I mean, there's some conceptual similarity and some ideas, but clearly some, like a lot of new stuff you're doing here. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, it's a new model, so I haven't really thought about, um, I mean, it's kind of catered to the streaming model. So I haven't really thought about uh, what it would mean to be like robust for a distributed sense. I think that um, could be yeah. an interesting area to think about. Yeah, so, and then, I mean, the sort of challenges they were they were looking at were of course different, but I, I think they're open questions. Like the fact you're able to kind of prove pretty strong results in this so robust sort of this adversarial setting might mean that you could revisit these, these Functional monitoring problems oh. maybe uh, apply some of these ideas. Oh, okay, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, so um, um, so along that line, so actually I've got a paper that's going to appear at so Sigma, so um, so this summer, including Ben Wei, who's one of my students, who's who's um, so looks like he's still on the call. Um, so it's looking at a um, so um, 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 so similar models here. At, um, again, I think it's on the other side. It's I think it's harder than the functional monitoring problem. And the idea is, is so to create some um, um, so some sketches that um, that um, 